right, Jacob. So it seems we're making an addendum to our basal social economics video. Yeah, I think it uh, it seems as if there might be a need for it because uh, mm, there's a lot of talk these days. Um, well, it seems everyone is now finally coming to terms with the fact that uh, things are really serious and might actually be crashing. So, so there's just a few things that I might actually see if I can't touch upon to make people see things a little bit more positive. Just, yeah. yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can't do that. First off, then, um, as you say, it seems to become apparent then that what the financial talking heads were talking about the whole time, uh, now they're screaming about it. It's uh, it's here more or less which would seem to re render a lot of people's normalcy bias uh, fairly bunk by now. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, of course, also a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, um, because when everyone is screaming that the, the ship is sinking, then, uh, well, everyone... No one's looking stuff. out for the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, then no one is trying to avoid the catastrophe. So, so that's really what this is about, and... and as I told you, there's a lot of people now pointing this out, and uh, of course the facts are also there. So, so there's just a lot of things to start thinking about now because uh, we need to get ready to rethink everything. Yeah, I mean, uh, with this coming change, let's be positive about it. Um, it makes no sense to, to to hang on to to any old idea unless you can argue it from these new perspectives. Well, the, the tragic thing is that, well, the the elephant in the living room is, well, the financial system and the banks as we have let them develop. Um, and this was some of the things that I would like to touch upon. Of course, there's a lot of good resources out there um, that people can look at. We're going to put some links to some of the um, videos and uh, some of the voices out there that really say something mm, valuable about financial history and the history of economics. Um, but this is about abstraction. I think we touched upon this in the other one. The, the big problem now is that because the financial system has basically been functioning on abstraction and on receipts, mm -hmm. then now when the value of these receipts is crashing and they're basically not worth the paper they're printed on, and there's nothing backing it. A lot of people is talking about are talking about um, gold and silver backed currencies, and what can we do in in the future to get back to some of the basics. But the paper have not, have not actually meant anything. It's mm -hmm. not worth anything. And then I was in a discussion um, on Facebook, <laughs> uh, actually, um, where I was just pointing out the fact that it's. It's kind of counter logic that everyone seems to be selling their shares in companies right now. Because this is actually uh, a huge fault, right? That's really a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any money left to invest, then a lot of people are saying that you should buy gold. This is fundamentally not fully correct because if you are buying into some deposit of gold if you're only buying a new receipt of gold you're mm -hmm. just going to risk the same thing um so you would be better off actually say buying gold and getting it in your hand a lot of people are also pointing this out but even better is ownership yeah because what you need to look at is look back at the the resources that we were talking about earlier how can you have access to or own those resources? Some people have the ownership of land, of structural wealth, of companies, uh, even of knowledge uh, still. Um, so, so that's really where you should place your money, in real value. So they should actually start buying shares in things that are hmm, fundamental. The more fundamental the product, the higher the value will be in the future. Right. But I mean, part of this, of course, is, is a general lack of trust in, in, in the system in general and in 
you know, in other players and, and I guess in, in the companies where whose stock are now well being sold off. Yeah, the the, the the problem is that the big players are taking out it looks as if the big players are taking out their money out of the companies, um, out of the, the actual real companies and putting it in paper. The the thing that it looks to me as if they're doing is they are trying to create a fear. They're saying, well, we can't trust companies. Well, you can trust companies more than you can trust a piece of abstract paper of something that we've been seeing go down the drain for the last, well, now four years. Yeah. So, so it seems extremely counter to logic to sell your shares in, say, a brewery to, to place it in, in bonds. Unless, of course, the reasoning is to... Uh, place your value or your wealth in things that are violence-based. What, such as fiat currencies? Well, most countries have already sold out of all their national ownership, so the only thing they have the right to still is taxation and war. Yeah. So unless they're, they're planning on banking on war, which I don't think they are, they're basically planning on... Mm, making everyone else panic and then you know, buy it up when it's done yeah bond everyone into even deeper slave labor no it's, it's more about ownership really um more once more so the thing that i that, that, that i was pointing out on uh, in the facebook discussion was that if you want to buy shares it is correct that it is not a good idea to own shares in uh the traditional way and this was uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch upon. It's about um, terms like in-street name mm -hmm. and having a portfolio. Because if you have a portfolio, you're basically only renting uh, some sort of virtual storage space to house your virtual receipt of a share. It's only a contract between you and the bank. The actual share is owned and held by the bank. Mm -hmm which is what is called in-street name. That means that the bank is the owner that is noted um, in, in the company. So if you are buying, say, Apple shares, you are buying access to a portfolio that is held by the bank, and the bank is actually the named owner of the shares in Apple. What you would ide ideally get or be more interested in is actually making a deal with the company directly. I'm not sure if there's even that possibility in the big stock exchange shares anymore, but in smaller companies, you can just put your name on it. Mm. Then you can be held uh, as an owner in name. So, so if the only option is buying into upstarts or smaller companies or companies that are not... In, uh, uh, being traded on the big exchanges, that should be where you put your money. Because then you have a clear contractual ownership in that company. Mm -hmm. Even if it's your friendly uh, local pub owner, if he creates uh, the company as a limited company, then you can actually have a true ownership mm -hmm. that can never be taken away from you. The, the fundamental structural value will remain the same. Right. And... Um within an economy of trust. Same with if you, if you don't have enough to actually buy, say, a bar of gold, or then make a, a small group of people and, and buy it and then store it in some location in, in common so, so you share the access to that wealth. Um, this is about um, making things bearable. We need, to, we need to get back to the, the, the way of thinking where it's not centralized, where we want our own assets in our own hands, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a portable medium. Uh, you used to have, um, well, bonds used to be something that you could trade um, without anyone knowing about it. It was actually kind of like money. It was a bearable bond. Mm -hmm. yep. You could transport it in, in your backpack and then you could give it to someone and and I think in, in my grandparents' uh, time, you would usually have bonds always as a physical thing that you had in your vault. Yeah. 
Um, and this is some of the things that we need to get back to, because then there is no discussion. Of course, then you get into the whole forgery issue, but <laughs> I would rather have a um, physical forgery is uh, issue and, and problem uh, where I can actually see and find proof of whether or not the bond is real mm -hmm. than what we have now where everything is just digital fraud. I have no chance of knowing that. So, so it's about getting back to the, the, the way of um, thinking in, in, a, in a natural way, um, getting things into the chattels mm -hmm. uh, category. Because that's really the only thing you can actually own in this world. That's chattels. You cannot own land. You're basically just, you've got a social agreement that you are allowed to have that instead of someone else. Mm -hmm. And you've got the whole thing that you need to uh, be registered as the owner so the government knows that you are now the actual person holding the lease, so to speak. Because yeah. they are then enforcing it with the police and the legal system and all that. Uh, otherwise things would be chaos, but you can't really own land. You can only have an ownership of something that you hold and can take with you. What is called chattel. And of course your knowledge and your skills and, 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 and your social capital, mm -hmm. that's all something you own. I mean, mm -hmm. in a sense you can, well, you can occupy land, but, but not own it, as, as you say. I uh, think the uh, Maori traditional cosmology, we have this concept called the ahika, which is the fires of occupation. Um, and that is, you have a right to a certain area and certain land, but only when you inhabit it, if you, you make use of it, if that, that is where you make your home. Yeah, th this could get us into the whole um, uh, housing problem with uh, empty buildings and and whether or not you should well, have a scrounging law in, in all countries. Um, but but okay, let's, uh, let's just play, play the, the privacy game just a, a little bit. To, uh, let's, let's indulge ourselves. I mean, do, do, you, do, you, do you think that the politicians will now uh, fairly soon be forced to come out and, and, well, speak the truth or something close to it because the realities are, are now undeniable? Well, I think we, I think the the politicians in the, in in the world will eventually figure out that we need some sort of new social contract, um, and we need to sort of rebuild our uh, economic systems um, because m many people are now suddenly opposed to the concept of money, but you can't really get around money. Money is a necessity uh, because it, it 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 makes communication of faster, extremely fast. Mm -hmm. So, the, again, the problem is really always uh, about the middleman and about how we have allowed the middleman to take over the entire system to a degree where it's no longer even uh, sane. Because one of the reasons that in old scripture and in almost any indigenous tradition there is very strict rules about uh, taking interest is because interest has a growth problem our society likes the term growth, but if you took um, the growth speed of uh, your standard fungus mm -hmm. when it's in bloom, right? Uh, if you had that continuously, it would reach, I think it's eight Earth sizes uh, within its uh, uh, growth time, which, which is within a year or season. Mm -hmm. It's, it's astronomical numbers, and, and this is the power of uh, the exponential function. Some of these things people really need to sit down and just inform themselves about. Uh, there's a very nice rule called the rule of, rule of 72, which is basically the natural logarithm to 72, and then you can easily take any um, interest rate and then just uh, divide 72 by the interest rate, and then you get uh, the doubling period. So if you have an interest of, say, 7.2%, mm -hmm. then it would double in 10 years. So this is just a nice rule to remember. It's called the rule of 72, and it's very simple for everyone to work with. The point is, when you have a system where low liquidity people are always the losers, 
this can only work in the benefit of the very wealthy, mm -hmm. right? If you are, if you've got two people buying a house valued at say one million dollar, the guy that's got liquidity already will be able to pay that instantly, right? So now he's not going to pay anymore. Mm -hmm. The person that's actually taking a loan, and let's say he is paying it uh, over thirty years, if he's paying say four uh, percent he's going to end up paying for that house two point something times so he's going to end up paying 2.5 million yep. that means that the, the 1.5 million that he's paid too much mm -hmm. compared to the price when he bought it is going to be shared between the bank and the new value of the housing Mm -hmm. to the person that had the liquidity already because he, he can now realize the same price for the house because the housing market will now be around two million instead so you're giving him a three million and the rest is going to go to the bank so the bank will be the middleman mm -hmm. in this contract so the social contract is upside down this yeah. is something that people need to start thinking about no, and, in, and in another sense i mean the, the guy buying the house for one million if he has the money um is getting it for free in that he has to put in no labor, whereas a person who ends up paying two, two point five, will have paid, in all likelihood, with a lot of labor. Yeah, it's a fundamental. Uh, it's fundamentally a game of chairs where the the poor guy and the slow guy is always losing, even though he's got the intention of actually paying off the house. It's it's the it's the amount of extra added work and mm -hmm. value that he needs to put in there. And the worst part is that they take this scam even further because they will then say that according to your social situation and your income, they will then put up an extra added price because of risk, saying that you are a high risk um, creditor, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you might not last 20 years at the rate you're working. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And again... In some sense, this also makes sense, but we do not get the numbers of this. We don't get the actual intel. We don't know if it's actually true that the main um, defaulters are the poor people. We have no clear evidence for this. And again, as I tried to explain when I, when I used the insurance uh, uh, business, you pay higher premium if you are poor and living in bad areas, right? Mm -hmm. But when you get your car stolen, it's not very likely to be a Mercedes, right? Mm -hmm. could, we get, could we get transparency? Could we maybe get to see the numbers? Because even if someone keys your car, if you're living in the boons, you don't even make a claim. You just leave it alone, yeah. right? Whereas the person with the Mercedes or the Ferrari, he's going to be paying through his nose or rather the insurance is. Yep. So he gets a cheaper insurance because he's wealthy and lives in a nice neighborhood and everyone else gets the very expensive and high premiums even though they don't have as, much, as many claims value based. Well, I just would like to see the numbers. I mean, do you know this or do you suspect this? This is partly suspicion, but it's also because when I see the, well, in, in the area where I'm living, um, the car insurance was about three times as high simply because of my address mm. and when I look out in my neighborhood well first of all the value of the cars are lower and when I look at the crime st st statistics they're not worse they're actually better than many other areas so I start wondering if there's uh, 20,000 people living in my area and there's a lower crime, and you take the equivalent 20,000 people in other areas, that's going to be a high area. So that's going to be a really high number of claims. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that I don't have the exact numbers, but I have the proof from my own situation, really. So I'm, I'm, and I'm just saying it's very well known that they don't give us access to this data, so they must have something to hide. Uh, yeah. That's my reasoning. I know that might be a little bit conspiracy theory and tinfoil hattery, but I would just like to see those numbers. And I, I feel that there's something fundamentally wrong about 
um, the insurance business because they seem to have record years all the time. So <laughs> it's not the clients that are benefiting, that's for sure. Right, and there are a lot of other Ponzi schemes going on, supposedly, so there's, there's no reason that that business or branch should be exempt. And when it's the big and important things, every single example I have, the insurance would not have been, were not being paid out. If you're talk, uh, talking about force majeure things like uh, like Katrina, mm -hmm. but but even if you're talking things like floodings, yeah. even though you've got it in black and white, flooding damages and they have to pay up, they will delay or not even pay out at all. And still people pay just to get that illusory sense of security. Yeah, but uh, and again, it's 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 the whole. Um, they get very mad very fast and 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 uh, raise your prices or make an issue of it if you don't pay in the right time or uh, the right amount. But when you then have an actual legal claim, they will try and delay it. And of course, the, the difference is something that they're going to make money on. So even if they're running a legit business, if they can delay you for just a month more than the speed with which you pay in, that's a month where they have liquidity to invest in something else. Mm -hmm. And in a growth economy, that's a lot of money. All right. But since that's, that is what we're leaving now, oh, it would seem, oh, we're getting closer to that point, we'll leave behind the growth economy. So um, going on what we discussed in the last video, social, basic social economics, what we need is an economy that lets, well, provides cheap, if not free, access to our basic needs, right? Yeah, and, and, and this is very much about, um, it's, it's, it's three stages, really. The first one is that we need to have a new social contract where everyone agrees that um, we need to make fundamental basic living cheaper all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, luxury is fine, we can compete on that, but things like uh, housing, water, food, all these things, we cannot accept any, any sort of artificial scarcity. This needs to be as cheap as humanly possible. Yeah. That should be a common goal and this will benefit everyone, not just the poor, also the, the, the wealthy. Um, Definitely. And, 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 the second layer is about ha trying to say that we have a goal on a national level in all, all nation states to reach some sort of acceptable Gini index, mm -hmm. some sort of wealth distribution that is actually going to be your, your um, real insurance. If you, if you have a nice Gini index, a nice wealth distribution, then even when something goes wrong, it's it's going to be easier to um, get back on your feet, mm -hmm. yep. and this is something that you can see in, in in the numbers that are coming out. The better the Gini index of the countries, the better they are insulated against uh, huge catastrophes like the current economic crisis. Well, I mean, we'll see if it plays out that way with this one also, right? Mm. Um. I mean, and in, in any case, just from an ethical perspective, it makes sense to say that we would like it to be that it's not the 1% that owns 99% of the wealth and vice versa. That, that's just sane. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what the movement 99% is all about. It's just, this is, uh, where, where is it? The, the U.S. has the highest GDP, but they are way down on the scale and there's actually African countries with better Gini index than them. But mm. that's just that that fundamentally makes them a developing country, which is horrible to even think about. And I think we've been losing five points or something like that recently in Denmark. <clears throat> which is quite a lot on the Gini index. Yeah. So it seems we'd be coming up upon some sort of a watershed. I mean if, if the euro collapses, which seems likely at some point, um, and we, we get all this social unrest, or a lot of it as, as it's so fancily called, um, 
well, that's not going to be pretty for anyone. So, so yes, we'll be coming out of this, um, yeah, a watershed for for people with who does have some or do have some capital to invest uh, to start investing it uh, locally in labor. Well, one of the things that that I think is really important is that both business and uh, individuals start thinking about what can actually be done. Mm -hmm. And again, this brings on one of the solutions that I believe is going to be very relevant soon is uh, getting options instead. Um, I think that's why I pointed out the, the thing about the shares market. If you are saying that you will work for less in a period uh, due to the troubles with liquidity, say for a big company like a brewery like Carlsberg saying, okay, I'm, I'm, it's okay, I will work for this company at this price because everything is now resettling price-wise and two-thirds even of my salary will be paid in ownership. Mm. That means I'm working for myself. Right? I'm not just working for some uh, cash and liquidity in my hand. Mm. This will also be a more natural way of, uh, of doing austerity and, and, and saving, right? Because you're saving in yourself. Yeah. You're not putting it in that paper bank. You're saving in yourself. You're getting an actual ownership with the company. So what will happen is that the big shareholders will then lose their positions because the workers and the invested parties will get it instead. And the same goes for business to business. If you are a business that is doing any sort of, of transaction with another business that is needed for life to be maintained, exchange shares instead. Hmm. Yeah. What this will do is that, that this will redistribute ownership and the real wealth into the hands of the people that actually work and create something. Gradually. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think people like uh, Warren Buffett might be shaking in his pants by now because he, he doesn't, well, he, 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 he's got a lot of ownership, so I think he can survive this. But um, he's not creating anything. But this is a natural way. Old people do not create anymore. They have their knowledge and they are sharing that and for that they are getting something in return. The actual creative part of society are the young people and the middle-aged people and, and so on and so forth. But the, but the point really is we need to get back to something that's more natural where we are not trying to create artificial growth or artificial needs. And artificial scarcity is along the way. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just going to be re, it's going to rebalance itself. It's, mm -hmm. it's why I'm saying that this is a really good thing. But it's some really big choices that we need to make, like that we do not have this extreme luxury drive. Mm -hmm. This would be the first step, really. Um, well, on, I mean, it, it's personal level. I've heard you say uh, earlier that in, in some years' time. Uh, wearing those huge, uh, huge diamond ring um, will be tantamount to, to cannibalism. It will. It will be so weird to... It's not... We will always have um, decoration and, and, and comparing each other and stuff like that. We will, there will always be peacockery. Mm -hmm. You can't get rid of that. That's a natural part of human life. It's just that you will no longer be able to piggyback on someone else's brand. Mm -hmm. So, so things like um, homemade clothing and uh, um, uh, homemade cars and things like that might actually become the next status symbol. Well, if you can build your own car and drive it, I mean that. I think most people think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and 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 even just networking yourself to have access to say artists that can uh, customize your car for you or um, make it run on LG mechanic, <laughs> mechanics that can that can make it more efficient or make it special in some way but this uh, all these things will be uh, a natural part of, of human life instead this takes us into the concept of uh, social capital yeah 
Yes, this is going to be um, the the really uh, big thing because you will no longer be valued on merits alone. You can't use merits for anything. Of course, you can have merits, but merits without um, provable experience is going to be useless. Um, so you might sit, sit there and, and flash with a doctorate and put that in, in people's face. But if you look at what people can get um, doctorates in these days, I just saw that uh, recent study in, uh, in Denmark where they said young people drink alcohol to have fun. Okay, I'm just going to... Seriously, did someone <laughs> take our tax money and pay someone to study that? Sounds like fun. And now he's got that on his curriculum vitae, right? He can put that in there on his CV saying, now I am an even better scientist. Uh, no, seriously, you're not. And, 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 and this is the, the whole, uh, it's like tautology science has become very famous. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's what I mean about your merits will only mean something if they are followed up by some real action, something that's uh, measurable, notable, admirable. I think it's Terence McKenna that says that in the future, one of the things that will be the, the fundamental economy will be admiration. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, also, I mean, the, the, the whole concept of a knowledge economy, it, I've never seen it play out within a, a growth economy setting. I mean, it, it, it's, knowledge can, can only attribute to you if you share it right. I mean, right? And if, the interesting if you, if you thing... just sit, sit there saying, yeah, yeah, I have this, it's mine, it's my patent, get, get away, get away, no. I mean... No one's going to, you know, pay you for that. Not, not the economy that's coming. No, but the interesting thing is that it will not be a, um, it, it will not be something that just caters to fame, because there will still be uh, a lot of room for niches, right? It's not going to be quantitative admiration that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. Qualitative is sometimes even better, because if you got some a small group of say admirers or people that you are networking and these people are actually willing to do something and not just be passive observers that will be a stronger value mm -hmm. socially than a lot of uh, hangarounds exactly so uh, that that's a little bit of a tangent really from from the main thing it's it's about what I wanted to touch upon is that people need to sit down and start weighing their pros and cons. Think, what am I actually worth? What can I do? How can I create value for someone? Is, what am I good at? What should I maybe improve at? Mm -hmm. And how can I support someone else with what they're good at? That easy. I mean, and and, and the thing, uh, yeah, the thing, uh, discussion I had earlier today with uh, another friend of mine um, is when you do labor for someone else, that it you know bears its own wages, um, and and that's a fairly real phenomenon. I mean, first of all, you might get a favor back, but you know, it's it it feels good, and and many people have forgotten that. Well, one of the things that, that, that frustrates me a little bit is if you look around in most circles, right, friendship and family and, and whatnot, if you start sitting down and looking at who's employed, who's unemployed, who's got the high wages, who got the, who's got the low wages, and then start comparing with uh, how many hours do they actually work mm -hmm. and how much spare time do they have, I'm pretty sure that we could distribute that a little better. Because I, my point is, if you're working 45 hours a week, right, mm -hmm. and two people in your family are without a job, maybe they could do something for, say, five hours each, and you would then have 10 hours more mm -hmm. each week for something you want to do. So the solution to unemployment really is not working more, but working less. Yeah share the load. It makes no sense that you have a whole 
group of people that have been artificially fallowed put out on the side and are now kept out of work so someone else can have more. This is, okay, that makes you uh, financially wealthy. It makes you uh, materially wealthy, but it makes you extremely time poor. Mm -hmm. You will not have the time to do anything you like. And if you really sit down and think about it, what is worth more, mm, a nice holiday with your family on iPhone. Exactly. Sometimes we just forget. Plus, I mean, if we, if in the days and years that are coming, more people will descend from the middle class to to some sort of poverty, while these all these tra changes are are happening, and having wealth and hoarding it, uh, you know, there will be a lot of envy coming your way, and it'll be a fairly uncertain situation in some countries, I'm sure. I think what's the point is that we don't want to lose what we have today. We need some sort of motivation for competition or of some kind, but it needs to be in a, in a, in a state where it does not actually be on uh, everyone else's back. Because it's okay that someone is more wealthy than, say me, um, but if I am time rich, I might not care. Mm -hmm. Oh, if, you, if you're fed and clothed, no. Exactly, it, and 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 some of the things that's really going to be very mind blowing is how this also shifts very much like the thing with the stock market that we were just talking about. People that are say working in immaterial wealth creation, mm -hmm. as we get reforms in uh, things like copyrights and patents um, and general immaterial uh, property rights. You're going to see a whole new way of being an artist. People that are well, painters, writers, entertainers. When these things are liberated from this very stringent and artificially priced system, they will actually have more work. They will be more productive. They will have more fun. Because something like mm, publishing a book, you will still be able to, su su to survive and you will even give get some nice payment for your work, but you won't need this inefficient system of uh, endless uh, expenses for trips and whatnot and uh, meetings with your editor and blah, 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 because you don't have to feed them mm -hmm. unless you want to. Because, of course, sometimes marketing and editing and all these things, they, they have some very important services it's just that their pricing is wrong because they have all the, the very expensive offices. They have some very high salaries. Mm -hmm. and, and it's always going to be the artist that pays for that. I think the, the, the standard royalty agreements are something like 5 or 10%. Yep. That means that the expenses and the cost for everything else goes to your editor and to your publishing company. It's extremely expensive. And I don't see how the client or, uh, or the customers are ever going to benefit from this. Mm -hmm. If you're a writer, your fan, fan base is not going to have a benefit from you making the books too expensive. On the contrary, you're going to sell less. Yep. Right. So, um, it's just, this is going to be very huge and it's going to be kind of like suddenly everything will just even out a little bit more. We will still have the pyramid structure, we will still have classes and stuff like that, but suddenly there's going to be a creativity and a productivity efficiency that's mind-blowing because you remove a lot of these old systems that it was like there's no one really at fault, it's just that we were so used to it working like that that we didn't even try to, to rethink it, we just let it run. And we've been leaving it for 300 years yep. without any, any real form of improvement or upgrade. The best thing that people have been able to come up with when it comes to upgrade is new scams instead of something to improve efficiency. Well, yeah, with some exceptions. I mean. Of course, there's always exceptions. It's just 
from uh, at the core what's the, uh, any new developments in finance the really relevant ones have been sort of ignored and things like uh, short selling and contracts for difference and all these things and CDOs and and derivatives and hedging and uh, yeah. there's a lot of weird stuff going on but it's always been only to suck out more wealth from the system oh I agree there though I haven't looked at it <laughs> nearly as closely as you have. Uh, no, I was thinking of things like solar cells. I mean, they have been invented and they have been they have been put up mm. here and yeah, there. Yeah, but, but but it's been um, it's been delayed. A lot of the development has been yeah. delayed because of the whole trickle up economics. Instead of having some sort of trickle down, instead of sharing wealth, because if you had, if if you had been more focused on real uh, free trade mm -hmm. and real competition and not these artificial monopolies, uh, then things would have been developing a lot faster and with a lot more wealth generated. You want to touch upon then the future ready concept of citizen wages or, or leave that one just hanging and, and cover it later? Well, I, I, I think we should uh, just touch upon it because it's very simple really. Um, in the transition phase into the new economy, a concept like a citizen uh, payment salary or something like that mm -hmm. could take the place of, um, well, it would be a, a stepping stone towards this um, um, e efficiency thing about s stuff like food and housing. So it would resolve that. Mm -hmm. And it should, of course, be, in some sense, a government-run system. Um, one of the really bad examples where I'm just, I don't know what to say about it. It's private companies running the food stamp system in the U.S. And the prisons. Yeah. So, so everything that's got to do with social contracting has been privatized mm -hmm. in the name of efficiency. And there's some merit to that, except if, if it's something that cannot actually be competed against in a fair way, if you cannot really have free trade, if it's all going to be about availability and there's only um, that much road, how, how are you going to compete with a road? You can only price compete. Mm -hmm. That means that you are, you are promoting some sort of cartel no matter what you do. So, so it's just a, a flaw of extreme proportions. We've got the same in Denmark where they've sold our railroads and, and our post office and everything has been sold. Mm -hmm. Everything that we should say, okay, this is something we've been working on and investing in for decades. How can we set a price on that? Did we actually get the payment with interest and interest of interest, compounding interest? I don't think so. I doubt it. So we've just been giving our money away. So, uh, on a practical note, now that we've you know laid out uh, a lot of solutions, uh, fairly practical, fairly easy to, to, to implement, um, say people uh, watch this video and say, ah, so what's the next step? I mean, seriously, where, whom do you approach with this information? Do you go directly to the politicians? Do you call up uh, business leaders, business no. executives? Start small and talk to friends and family and do it in, in, in a practical way in your real own life, right? Ask your, your boss, is there a possibility that I could get paid in, in options instead? Mm -hmm. So I could get shares, right? And when you get uh, shares, then eventually you might actually be able to sell them and say, okay, I'm going to make my own company or I'm going to invest in one of my friends or my family or my local butcher. Mm -hmm. Everything you do that takes away money from what I call the useless eater system mm -hmm. is going to enrich you. So if you are a, a co-owner in your local butcher instead of uh, letting everything be Tesco's and whatnot, you're going to make money. You might not see it initially, but you're going to get it eventually. Right. Because that person is now the one that's got the money instead. Mm -hmm he will be able to buy something from you, and so on and so forth. So we're really trying to remake the economy from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And of course it's going to repeat itself in some way, but hopefully we will be on a new 
standard of living by then, so then it's not really a big problem. One of the things that always uh, amazed me a little bit about you is, is, is well, a great respect for that. You, you, you seem to not to buy into any of the uh, dystopic mumbo jumbo at all. It's like it cannot even touch you. I mean, uh, you don't fear this no, because there's a, at all. There's always a limit, right? There's always a limit. Mm -hmm. uh, take a, a good example. Now, now you've got the whole Occupy Wall Street thing running, and there's a limit to how much hmm, you will be able to send out your croonies, right? Your 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 cops and have them beat the population. But at some point they will have had enough. Was it, I, that's actually my neighbor you're asking me to beat up now. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be part of the system anymore. I'm going to turn around and then I'm going to go and say, I'm not going to hit him anymore. I don't care what you say. It's, it's, the, it's the taskmaster thing. There, there's no one, there's not enough people in the world that are that um, morally defunct for that dystopia to develop, really. I don't believe that. That's not my experience. When I see people, most people, even when they're doing something wrong, they don't know. It's only because of lack of knowledge. And, and as I told you, that was where I was. I was doing investments. I was making a shit ton of money with uh, <clears throat> investments. Mm -hmm. Well, not that many, but enough to actually make it really comfortable. And I never asked myself where that money came from. And when I then figured it out, I said, I cannot be part of this anymore. And I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. Human beings are really inherently good. It's just that we are no longer mm, naturally prone to ask ourselves who benefits. Who is actually doing this? Yeah. Do even I benefit? So uh, it's, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is, yes, you are. You, you need to tell someone if you know something. If, you, if, if your boss is, is acting in a bad way towards you, you need to tell someone. You need to inform someone about it. If, if, if he is actually a psychopath and he's actually being destructive for your business, he's going to cost all of you your job, maybe. And that's the great thing about being alive these days. Now people listen. Yeah, because we're getting too much information, and it's too easy to share information. Maybe, yeah, maybe a little bit dangerous. But uh, I hope people will stop telling me when or tweeting when they go to the toilet, <laughs> or when they've just been puking or something. I don't need to know. Thank you very much. Don't okay. need to know. Think we maybe cut it there? <laughs> yeah.